So let's hold our Bibles up and let's say it together. I believe this is a perfected word of God. I believe that in the volume of this book speaks about my Lord and my Savior, Jesus Christ. And I desire not only to read it, to know it, to the power of God's Holy Spirit, and live it. Amen? The Calvary Chapel will always pray every day. Amen, amen. <laughs> How many of you uh, last night reflected uh, on your past as, as, as well as your future? I mean, really, this is what this, uh, this whole New Year and, and New Year's Eve really comes in thinking of this new year. It, it, it's, it's like having a, a new beginning, if you will, for many of us. You know, we, we say, man, you know, this year is going to bring more opportunities, and, but it's going to bring more challenges in my life. It, it, there's going to be a change, and I'd like to try again on the things I failed on. Uh, I, you know, I want to change those old ways. I want to become, I pray, even better than I was last year. Uh, and, and almost like starting a new slate, it, this fresh start. And so looking at this coming new year, we make what Jim was talking about, the, the new resolutions. You know, I, and before I knew Christ, we all used to do that. You know, we're, we're going to stop something. We're, we're going to stop losing those 10 pounds. And, you know, I mean, you probably all have said that. You know, I, I'm going to stop that exercise program. You know, you go out and buy machines and they're still sitting in, in the bedroom in the garage all dusty now. And you're using them to hang racks and clothes on. But to, at least to get the use of it, right? You know, many of us say, you know what, I, I really want to commit myself to reading God's Word every day. Like, you know, these are, these are good things, you know, you're, you're, but this is what this season brings. It, it brings that desire, old acquaintances, if you will, let those things be forgotten. We want to start this new thing. And so we, we, we even seek the Lord and pray. I mean, even this morning I was praying, Lord, I pray this year that, that, that I would just be that better man, you know, for my wife, be a better husband, and, uh, a better grandpa. Just, just let these things in my life that I don't like be taken from me. And, and so we, we all have that desire. You know, some people say, I want to, you know, I'm a Christian, I'm smoking, I want to stop smoking. Jim, we're just talking about that this morning. You know, and sometimes we make the efforts and we try, and sometimes just simply hearing the simple, small, still voice of God and believing in it and, and accepting it. I mean, that happened to me in my smoking. I was praying, driving, and I was smoking. I had a pack of cigarettes up there. And you might have heard this in my testimony, but I was praying, God, take this habit away. And you know, I, I don't know what to tell you, but I knew that I knew that I knew right then I was touched by God. I don't know what it was and everything. And I literally, you know, broke the law. I rolled down my windows and started to throw my cigarette packs out. And uh, not a fact, I... Good thing it wasn't today, he'd probably shoot my gun because well, I threw one pack out and hit the guy's window <laughs> next to me and he looked at me really mad. But you know, I knew God touched and God healed me. You know, and so we, we desire to have that. We want to get rid of those bad habits and desire to, to break them to make a new resolution, this new coming year. I, I'm, I want to change. And, uh, and change is what this particular occasion is, is always seems to bring out in our hearts and, and, and please don't misunderstand me change is good and, and God willing we will change for the better and pray that we would pray for those things in our lives to be changed whether it be a better relationship with our spouses or more communication with our children or maybe more prayer time with the Lord and a deeper prayer uh, many of us have uh, Shallow prayers, simple prayers. They're, they're prayers that are said in 30 seconds. Um, but maybe deeper prayers where we actually wait on the Lord and listen to His voice and do less talking and more hearing uh, of what the Lord has to say. And so this is what we see in this, this year, but there are some things that, that they just don't change. And, and probably shouldn't change. And, and, and all those things, that, you know, these are the things I like for us to look at and as believers here this morning, 
You know this, but as Paul says, I don't think it's tedious that we reflect and remind ourselves about this, especially starting this new year. And by the way, I'm all so blessed that you're here today. I, I actually thought this church would be full. Uh, to start a new year's up, you know, to say, let's start the new year going to church and start regularly doing that and, and, and so forth. And I, mean, I mean, there's no football games today, right? Yeah, there is. There is? <laughs> All day. I thought it was going to wait to, oh, that's the Rose Bowl. Tomorrow's the Rose No parade, nothing. But there's football. <laughs> In John's Gospel, chapter 1, you can open up there, which is our text for this morning. It, it speaks of the unchangeable and the durability of the Word of God. It says, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him, nothing was made that was made. <clears throat> In him was life, and the light was the light of man. And the light shined in the darkness, and the darkness did not have ended. And down in verse 14, And the word became flesh, dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And this is a scripture you should always have highlighted in the Bible. When you forget about your worthiness, when you forget about your future, you don't know where it lies and holds, and you're wondering about what's taking place in your life. <coughs> When tragedy hits, sicknesses hits, um, uncertainties come that brings anxiety and worry, we need to turn to realize that in the beginning was the Word. Before all the problems of the world, before sin, before the fallen world, before all the troubles that we see today that has erupted from a fallen world, in the beginning was God. And God is the Word of God. And of course we've got in 14 that that Word is always representing Jesus Christ. The one who says, I'll never leave you or forsake you. The one who never changes, never, no shadow changing in the Father. And so we see that in the beginning was the Word. That, that, that divine created code, if you will, that called everything into being. And that word was with God, and that word was God. God was from the beginning, before all that was ever created, before we as humans ever took our first breath on this earth, God existed. He had no beginning. He was always. He had no end. He's eternal. This is a God that the Bible tells us to trust have faith in, that the things of the world should not dim our eyes upon the magnificence of the great Creator, our Lord, all-knowing, all-powerful, all-night-present God that's here with you right now. It's so easy for our circumstances and, 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 and that we face in life can bore uh, the significance of the glory of God. Because we know God can and can do anything. And we pray for whatever it would be to be changed or touched or healed or renewed. And sometimes it doesn't happen. Sometimes people pray all the way to their dying bed. And we lose the sight that when the Lord says that He is our healer, by the stripes of our Lord, we are healed. Our greatest healing is when we transform into our new body, into the glory of God. But we think the greatest healing is heal my neck that is twitched right now, my back I pulled out. 
my leg that's hurting, my liver that's failing. And yes, God can and will, if He desires, can do that, but we live in this natural order of God, the code that God created for mankind. And that code, sorry to say, when the world has fallen, bringing in all sorts of things into the world, we still don't understand. The capability of living a healthy, strong, wealthy life is very little, I think, next to realizing the contentment and joy that is in Jesus Christ in the midst of whatever. I always thought it was interesting that we're the groom, or he's the groom, we're the bride. And when I think about that, I'm wondering what vows did we make to our Lord when we came to him as his bride? I know our worldly vows are simple, right? Through hell and through sickness, with life and death, we shall be together until that death separates us. These are the vows we make to our spouses and our loved ones, maybe to just people we know. How much greater vow the love of God has for you? I, I just want you to know this coming year at Calvary Chapel, this is why we want you to know the unchangeable durability of the Word of God. Because the Word of God is Jesus Christ. He is the rock that we stand on. And you know, when those things come in our lives, the Bible calls them, you know, winds, turbulence, turmoil, turmoil, storms of our life, whatever you would want to call it. If you're on the rock and your foundation's on the rock, no matter what comes, you might bend a little, but you won't get broken. Because he's your rock. And you know, we got that other aspect of the Bible of building on the sand, the shrubble, he, where things are not durable. And you know what those things represent? Our self-will, our emotions, our reasoning, our understanding. Those are foundations of sand because they can overcome us and literally diminish us and, and drown us if we don't destroy us. And so we know that Christ is the rock and He is the Word. And so we want you to understand that the Word is God, Jesus Christ, and that we need this year coming to say, I will not be moved on these circumstances that I come from next year, but I will stand on the rock of God. And so before all things, the Word, which is God, our Lord Jesus Christ, as we read in verse 14, the Word became flesh. And so the Word, which is God, was, is, and will be. And in Hebrews 13, 8, the Word says that, right? We want to clarify this with the Bible. Jesus Christ is the what? Saying yesterday, today, and we hope tomorrow. No, tomorrow is forever. Yesterday, today, and forever. The unchanging God, the one that you said, Lord, I surrender to you. Come into my life. I'm a sinner. I need you. Keep that faith in the one you committed yourself to for your salvation. And he will continue to do the work he started to perform in you until the day of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And don't let the tragedies of the world, the circumstances of the world, sway you to any other direction but standing on the Word of God. And please don't misunderstand me. Anything in our lives that is difficult is hard. Especially when we deal with any illnesses or sicknesses or so forth and we find out our body for some reason isn't like it used to be. Yeah. Amen. I mean, I have to accept, we have to, when we're young, we're vibrant, right? Our skin is tight, and we're everything, but when we get old, it all just, it's like an old tent, Paul says, <laughs> isn't it? I mean, you put up that new tent, you can flip a quarter on it, and it'll bounce. You use that tent after 5, 10, 20 years, it just sags. You know, that tent used to be like this, now it's kind of like, and he says, that's our body. You know, I can get so thin, but it doesn't matter. I still got old skin that's kind of hanging around. 
they don't understand how they got here because they don't know God. And so they're trying to figure it out. They, and, and, and so today, everywhere we look, we see this interest in the spiritual realm. And, and, and we see it on TV, programs coming up with it all the time. And, and people advertise this interest that maybe people take a, a range, and, and you can see it, it's from profound to bizarre. Uh, interesting. It, it really saddens my heart. People looking for something in life and it's so easy to have, but they just can't believe the simplicity of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And, and they look at it. The aliens have come and we are planted. They, we have created uh, from evolution. And so you're your monkey's uncle or your sign that came out of the earth. Uh, how does this when they get confused who we are, they try to figure out how the universe was developed. So they create the Big Bang Theory. And, you know, and it goes on and on and on. They're creating all these things. And because the world hears these great psychiatrists or doctors or philosophies or whatever it is, they take it for word and, and they, they start to believe in it. And they search the spiritual realm. They try to connect with their loved ones that have passed on the other side. They don't know what the other side is. We don't call it the other side, we call it home. We're already citizens. These are foreign people, they don't know where they belong, they don't know where they came from, they don't know what's happening in their life, they don't know how to, when things happen, what do they do? And this is why our world's a mess, this is why the devil is so, so creative and telling people, well, just drink and get rid of the problem. Don't worry about it. Take some pot or take LSD or take whatever drug there is. You know, just forget about it. Just drown yourself in this and all the worries and concern and all these difficult times you have. But there is, this is where it lies. This is our society, how sad. My heart goes out to them. The longing to be connected. The unchanging need to be in a relationship with something of meaning that is more than just ever, uh, just our ever-changing uh, everyday lives. You hear people say, you know, life is just a merry-go-round. You know, you get up, you do this, you go to work, you do this, you come back, you do this, you do that. You know, you know, with Jesus Christ, a merry-go-round is fun. Amen. How many like merry-go-rounds? See, every day is a new day for me. Now, I might have my routine, but I'm going, wow, but what does God have in mind for me? Because I don't know what God has in mind for me. You know, so I wake up and I say, well, I know the first thing I'm going to wake up do is wash and shower. That's the routine. I'm going to do this. Take my doggy party. And, you, know, you know, the big masculine man with little prints. You know, dear boy, do you? But then God brings something in my life that's challenging. He brings something in my life that wants to stretch my faith, wants to increase my love for Him, or wants to show me my shortcomings. He wants to do something with me to, to show me that He has greater plans for me than just the merry-go-round of life. If we just let Him to be part of His great kingdom, He is allowing each one of us to become a, a servant to build His kingdom. That's incredible. He gives in us the Word of God, the treasure of the kingdom of God. The Bible calls us clay pots, and He puts these treasures in these clay pots, all dry and cracked and everything, and He wants us to let the light shine through them that people in the world we're talking about that are searching for a home, searching for some significance of life, can come to the one who gave life. And the one that can create such great things in our life. Another unchanging human need is an, an, an intense longing to know, to be known, to love, and to be loved. As the world becomes increasingly depersonalized, this need to know, to be known, this need to love and to be loved becomes even more profound. And I truly believe that's why people are finding their way back into the church where they find a community of people that they can truly know. That they walk in, they are known. 
by name. Hi, how you doing? What's happening? You know, it's a community, a place where they find true love. Not love based on favoritism or based on any other thing, but based on the simplicity that Jesus says love one another. And we see the love he gives in us, so we want to share with other love. This is why I'm so glad we are a hugging church, whether you like it or not. You know, I'm a hugging person. So, you know, you, you, some people put their hand out, you know, I just, I just like, that's, what is that, just the arrow? Like they go, okay, yeah, yeah, I forget that. No, oh, some new people are like, oh. But they love, they love it. See, people long for the acceptance. You know, they don't have to perform to get a reaction of friendship or love. They don't have to dress in a particular way. You know, it's not that we don't have a click here and a click there. It is just one body, one family, one loving each other. And so people in the world are wanting that, but they're going to the happy hour to find it. They're going to places that only have temporary, in, unsatisfying uh, fulfillment, if you will. And it's, it's sad. And so we have all these different clubs out there because they want to be part of something. From the worst to the good. I mean, the worst is people become a gang member because the gang is like, we're one, we, we keep each other's back, we watch each other's back. They, they feel accepted, they feel like something, but they're in a gang. They, they commit violence and so forth, but they still want to be part of that gang. You know, I, I would buy that stuff back then. Oh, it could be other things. People getting bizarre stuff to be with something or someone. But isn't it wonderful to, to, to be in Christ? And that you can come and be accepted and be loved and, 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 and hug one another and, you know, and, and realize they're not looking at how tall I am, how short I am, how old I am, how young I am, which is all in one Jesus Christ. That's what, that's what this thing's all about. It's about the unchanging word. The durability of it. I think the third longing within human nature that doesn't change is desire to do something of meaning and, and value before we die. To make some kind of a contribution, however small, that, that will, will make a difference. You know, before I knew God, I would never give to the church. I mean, I came to a place to give, you give a quarter, and that was my tithe. I didn't know what tithe was. Now, to me, it's an honor, it's a privilege that I can give my first fruits back to God and knowing I'm making a change because we're involved in missionaries. That we sit here today but because of your tithes, because we take a percentage of what you give, and that percentage goes to mission. And so we only have a few, you know, the Mercy Ship, you remember you heard about that, we, you support that. You know, and of course we support you turn for Christ, which is helping drug addicts, so forth. We support Dan Finfart, who was here a few weeks ago, or something, that, that goes throughout the world teaching pastors how to teach the Word. And those things are all recorded in heaven. Whether you give to this church or you give privately to missions, that's a contribution of my life that I'm going to receive in heaven. I'm not looking for man's reward now. I don't wave my tithe and offering or, you know, I'm going to do this for someone. Look at this. Everybody, somebody give me a clap, please. <laughs> Jesus said, don't do that. The Bible tells us don't all let you let you don't even let your left hand know what your right hand is doing when you're giving. In other words, that's how simplicity should be. So people need to know that their lives have a difference, that they make a difference. I am so blessed when I, I get the privilege, Pastor Greg, and, and many of you, when the difference, imagine how many of you had people come to Jesus and see their life change because you shared the gospel with them. What an exciting thing. You made a difference. 
They want to have that value that can, they can leave a mark, if you will, on society, that they cannot just be part of a great wheel of life that is expendable. Uh, you know, they don't want to be. They want to be part of something that's in, in, enduring. And so the world we see gives great charity things, and they want to be remembered in those things. But the Word of God says once they die, they perish and they are forgotten. But see, when, when the children, the child of God, many of you might not even think of the changes you probably make. You won't even know some of the significant changes you have made until you enter heaven. And, and see people that you thought you would never come to Christ, but you just share the Word. You just say, well, I shared it. I hope it worked. And for some reason, or that track you laid on the table, or whatever it would be. Leave me, brothers and sisters, don't let the enemy fool you. You're making changes. Your life is making a change into a fallen world by representing God and helping it out. And so they, 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 the people of the world, they don't want to just accept this great wheel of life that is expendable, dispensable, and especially you know, replaceable. And so they want to make it significance. And then finally, you in the midst of a world marked with confusion. A world we live right now is uncertainty, stress, unhappiness. People long for some kind of peace, order, and contentment, and joy. Never before have people had so much and yet experienced such poverty of spirit. Our relationship with our children and loved ones are falling by the wayside because of technology. I told my kids, because they always text me, Happy birthday, Dad. Happy New Year. I got a text. It doesn't smile at me. You know, they, they try to make it personal, right? Well, put a heart there. Put a smiley face. Put a bang. So when I really go, oh, ee, ooh. Really? I love FaceTime. I mean, I can't talk to him. My grandson got an iPhone for Christmas. And he, uh, he FaceTimed me. Hi, Papa, I got a new phone. So I'm talking to him. I'm seeing him. He's laughing. He's smiling. I mean, uh, he's... He, he, 2,200 miles away, but I see him. You know, now, I can't get it. Now, don't take me wrong. You know, you want to take, God bless you, take your little fingers away. <laughs> but I'm a, I'm a person guy. You know, I, I want to hug you, tell you, see you, something. And, and then, you know, and then the next day, he calls me up. I just love this. Pop, are you busy? I go, no, no, Malcolm, what do you need? Well, I got two friends here I want you to meet. <laughs> So he showed the other friend, oh, hi, how do you do? Oh, and which one in? You know, and I'm talking to his two friends, and I thought it was just so awesome. He goes, oh, you're going to meet my papa. You know, but that's what I want. And please don't take me wrong, because I know some people text me, and that's okay. You know, but, you know, we are desensitizing ourselves. That's why it's so important you hear. At least hear once in a while, once a week, twice a week. We can actually see you and hug you. Say, how do you do? How are you doing? Can I pray for you? Whatever it would be. You know, never before have we had access to so much information in this world, yet communicate with one another so adequately. How many of you have uh, heard of Alexia or the little echo? The boy got me one. It's a little home thing. You said it there in the program. So I can wake up and I go, Echo, give me a Bible verse. And, and my Bible verse today was, you know, yeah, for God so loved the world, he gave us. That's, uh, then I might go, hey, Echo, you know, tell me a joke. You know, tell me a joke. You know, you know which batteries are free? Dead ones. That, that was that the best you could do. It. But, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm thinking, I'm talking to this loud device. And I say, well, at least I got somebody here that will answer me. Even if I go, Echo, do this, you go, I don't understand what you're saying. 
right? I know our husbands and wives, we don't even get that, right? I don't understand what you're saying. But then think about how this, you know, where is it all been? I mean, how many of you remember the day when you used to threaten your kids to get indoors by seven? Remember those days? God, you're not that old. I remember my mom said, you can go out and play, but you better be in the house by eight o'clock. You know, today you can't get them out of the house. They're in the room with their games and their videos and their iPod, and you say, go play baseball. What's that? I want to play baseball. <laughs> we used to play baseball, tennis, and uh, flag football, and, and you know, just everything was up. We hated to come home. Sure. Well, we come home to eat. <laughs> Can I stay here? Can I go out here? Can we go ahead? But now, it's like the kids, you know, you're, you're going outside, it's like you're telling them, to, you're kicking them out of the house or something. Well, you don't love me. That's it. And then you go to restaurants. And, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to get the picture here. Think, oh, I mean, everybody's on their phone. People are running in the post as they walk, texting. I'm serious. You go in the restaurants, it used to be the newspaper that covered, now it's all this. Did you order? I know. They don't even want to communicate at Starbucks anymore. I can order now my drink online, go in there and pick it up and go. You know, every once in a while I go, hey, hi, remember me? <laughs> hi, Jim. Go with it. <laughs> Never, I think, in history have we been spread so thin and experienced so little death. And I'm afraid it's creeping into the church. Shallow Christians. They, want to, they don't want to get rooted too deep. They don't want to get in depth with the word. They don't want to get in depth in prayer. Everything is, is just, you know, very little depth. We crave simplicity while we strive to accumulate more more money, more things, and more sources of stress than I know those things that will bring. None of which we really need. We just think we do. In the beginning was the Word. The Word hasn't changed. And the Word continues to respond to all these basic needs I shared with you this morning. Longing. It doesn't change. Persist all time for eternity. The word is what calls us into that being as God's finest creation. Isn't that love? I love that. You are his apple of his eye. You are the jewels, his riches. He gave everything for you. God's finest creation. And he lovely invites us into a relationship with him. And whenever we wander off, and we will, it's the word that gently nudges us back. That's why we need to be here, to hear the word, and have it in our hearts, creating a sense of illness, if you will, that is satisfied only by our change, our turning around, returning to the source of life. And I know many of us have taken that path off the road and we realize the emptiness of the word. We realize when we don't go to church, we stop reading, we sense it, we know it. And it's God nudging you back and the word of God and finally get you back on track. The word knows us much better than we know ourselves. And the word continues to love us through thick and thin, through those good times, those bad times, whether we know it or not, whether we realize it or not. The Word is what gives our life meaning and value throughout our worship and through what we say and what we do. The Word is the unchanging guidepost that leads us, navigates us through our life of changing. And there will be changes this year. So stay steadfast. The Word allows us to be able to sort out what does 
and shouldn't change from what doesn't and should change. It's a part of what's being part of us. I'm so thankful for the Bible because it helps me in my direction and path of life. It helps me make decisions. It helps me to have a better marriage, better relationship. It makes me a better pastor. It makes me a better person. And I can always tell when I drift from the Word, my old nature begins to come back. All these thoughts of insignificance. Oh, really, when the Word begins, uh, or the world begins to tell me, you know, you don't really need to do it. Don't, you don't need to read the Word today. It's no big deal. That's a lie. You don't need to be at church. Church doesn't get you into heaven. That's true. But at least I feel like I'm in heaven a little bit when I'm at church. And I need that. I need that sanctuary. I'm so thankful that you're here at Calvary Chapel Valley on Sunday mornings, Wednesday nights. Those various programs that we have, the activities that we have during the week, we have those for you. It's not like my leaders have nothing else to do. But the desire they have for the Word, they see how it affects them. They sacrifice their family, they sacrifice their time, their lives to give it to you. And that's all you've got to do is come. And come to be blessed, to be heard, to be encouraged. And so I, 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 I'm speaking of myself as well as everybody else. I don't exempt myself. I think when I, I'm overcome by my circumstances of things in life, it's simply because I haven't taken the initiative to be where I should be. To be around supported, surrounding, praying people that love me. To be around the Word of God that I hear, that will encourage me and wash me and cleanse me and renews me. Instead, I decided to go here, do this, and do that, and I began to understand the significance of church is not as great as important as I thought it would be. But that's why God created the koinonia, the fellowship, the assembly, the gathering. And that's why he tells us in the word, neglect not the gathering of one another. And I pray this year you'll commit to that. Always be walking with the word, always be. But I pray, commit here at Calvary Chapel for yourselves. That when my leaders and me and Greg and Vince get up here and preach, we love what we're doing. But our heart's desire is to do it for you. And if you're not here, we can't. The unchanging nature of the word is ultimately what makes us fully human, fully alive. And that will never change. So I can have the worship team come forward as you think about this new year resolution. What you wish to change, the areas in which you need to grow. Think also of the unchangeable word, which is God, which is Jesus Christ our Lord, on which you depend. Do all in your power to strengthen your grip on the word as you face this new year and all the changes it will bring without doubting it. And I'm asking you today, as brothers and sisters, because I pretty much know everybody here. If you want changes in your life, let me pray for you this morning. If you want to be know what it is, don't just stand to stand, stand to commit. Don't just stand because you're emotional. Stand to realize that I'm purposing my heart. When I stand and pass the praise, I'm going to commit to perform that through the power of God the rest of this year. So if you want changes somewhere in your life, in your marriage, in your walk, in your strength with God, just stand this morning and allow me to pray for you. But stand with a committed heart, please. Amen. Father, I thank you. For my sisters and brothers, I heard your word. You are unchangeable. We're so thankful. And Father, they're standing up this morning, desiring things in their life they want changed, or rekindled, or renewed. Only you know each individual, as we read today, you know, you're the all-knowing God. You know intimately their lives. These are your children that stand this morning, saying, Father, do this, I pray in the name of Jesus. They want to commit to this. They want a purpose in their heart. So I'm asking for the empowering of the anointing of your Holy Spirit 
who is able to do and to perform the desire through your power. And dear Father, I pray that they would be steadfast, unmovable in this desire. Dear Father, they would not get beat up if they fall short of what they committed to today. They'd get up and get back onto the promise and the commitment they desire. Lord, we all stumble, we all fall, but it's not getting back onto the, to, to the path, if you will, that you have set for us. So dear Lord, I pray that they would know, that they know, that they know today that you heard their prayer, that they would sense your presence, that they would sense your power, and when you walk to these doors, no matter what lies before them today and the rest of their lives, because every day is not a new year, but it's every day is a new day for us as Christians. Your mercies are fresh every morning, and your grace shall follow us all the days of our lives. And that they are your children, more than conquerors, their Father, that are in Jesus Christ. And it is through him they will be strengthened. This we pray in your name. And we all agree and say, Amen. Amen. You can be seated. Amen. I just want to let you know that um, as I'm sharing today, new changes, new things happening in our lives. And you all know that for the last year or so, I've been telling you about stepping away from the pulpit and, and turning it over to Pastor Greg. Well, January will be the last month I'll be teaching, and I'll be turning the church over to Pastor Greg in February. He'll be the senior pastor. I will be the associate pastor. I'll still be here for quite a while. I, I just got a lot on my plate. I think this is something I've been praying about. I see God now why he's wanted me to do this was taking place in my life and my family. And so I just want you to pray. My desire is that remember you're here for the Word of God. You're here for Jesus. You're not here for me. You're here for Jesus. Support Pastor Greg. He's a great teacher. He's been here 20 years with me. I've been training him for seven, eight years to finally do this. I'm, I'm praying that Greg will allow me, I'm sure he will, to be in the pulpit every so often. And uh, I might add it. You know, I, I was just talking to somebody. I don't know, Sandy, maybe. I'm always talking to Sandy. But uh, I might ask Greg maybe uh, on a Wednesday night, uh, pure worship. I, I would love to teach the gifts of the Spirit and begin to have some afterglows and prayers. And, and maybe I could do that. But there'll be things. I, I'm not going anywhere right now. I'll be here for quite a while. Right now, you have to understand my priority is my daughter. Sunday, of course, my wife and me. And so, remember, and that's for all of you, God's first. Family is second. Your workplace is third. Ministry is fourth. You need to get the priority right. And, uh, and make sure that you want to be in ministry. All those other ones are significantly fulfilled and supported by your loved ones or relatives or spouses and so forth. And this is why Calvary Chapel, I've always been very family oriented with Greg, my past family, the drill family. You go take care of what you need to do. Yeah, because we are family. We'll always be family. Amen? So God bless you. The Lord be with you. And I pray this year will be prosperous and blessed. Now you can all stand and go out praising God.